Uh, so today we're going to be getting a little bit familiar with our own mental health. Uh, talk a little bit about the difference between mental health and mental illness. Uh, a little bit about the stigma, why it matters, and how to know it's time to get support. Uh, the world we're living in today really has no reference point for us to understand what's happening and what normal is and that sense of normal. So just being really intentional and con conscientious about your mental health and knowing when to do those mental health check-ins so that you can stay, stay healthy. So that's what we're gonna be covering today. My favorite question, and the first question uh, when I do this with, uh, with groups in the, in the schools, um, to ask the question of who has mental health. And what's really interesting is, I don't know if it, it's, it's not for everyone as the stigma is slowly getting diminished, but there still is a lot of stigma around the term mental health, like the word mental and mental health and just how that lands for people. And so often it's really hard to resonate with mental health and that that's something that I need to be thinking about. But when you really think about it, mental health isn't any different than physical health, right? Everyone has a mental health makeup, just like you have a physical health makeup. You have a physical makeup, you have your mental makeup. These are part of just being human. And so mental health, everyone has it. And it's really about our own normal, whatever that may be. And that is different for everyone. And we'll talk about that. No one, no two people's normal is the same. It really is a personal, a personal um, format for everyone. We all have different ways of thinking, feeling, acting in certain situations, the way we respond to the environment around us. And there's a different sense of normal for each of us. So personal mental health. Mental health is the, it's the capacity to think, feel, and act in ways that enhance our ability to enjoy life, to deal with those day-to-day -day life challenges. And so we all have mental health and being mentally healthy is about being at your own normal. A mental illness, on the other hand, is when we're not at our own normal. It's when something in our own sense of normal changes and just makes it harder to enjoy life and deal with the day-to-day -day challenges and it starts to make it so it's harder to function in, that, in, in your day-to-day. -day. So today we're, we're talking about mental health, which is something everyone has. Now, if you're living with mental illness, there's components of one affecting the other and we'll touch on that brief briefly, we're going to be uh, talking largely about mental health. And so when we talk about normal, there's no standard normal. Uh, so your mental health range, you'll have kind of this range that you typically fall in, you know, given you have some great days, some maybe not so great days. My own normal, I'm wired a bit different. So my normal is very broad. I'm on the bipolar spectrum, which means that I can be really, really high or really, really low. But I have a, a range that's normal for me and I know when I go outside of my own normal and when it's time to reach out. So where you're at on any given day can vary, right? Maybe yesterday you're feeling super resilient, really confident, in flow, just able to kind of take on the day's challenges, not a lot of worry, anxiety getting you down. You could handle it. Maybe today it's not feeling quite so resilient. Maybe there's a little bit more turmoil going on inside and maybe you've doing nothing, maybe tomorrow you continue to just degrade uh, into kind of less optimal mental health because it is on this continuum. So mental illness and mental health, they do operate on a continuum where your mental illness can affect your mental health. So if you are living with mental illness, you know, suffering from an anxiety disorder or depression, um, you have being really conscious of your mental health state is important to managing life with a mental illness. One affects the other, and they are on a spectrum where your symptoms will range from you know, very serious symptoms to no symptoms. Uh, you can recover from mental illness, and then mental health from like poor mental health to optimal mental health, and just really paying attention to where are you at at any given moment on your spectrum, your mental health spectrum. So today we're faced with this world that isn't normal, right? So we're going to be talking about intentionally practicing ways to check in on your mental health and come from a place of detachment and curiosity and what happens as we start to create space to explore in a way that doesn't feel so scary. And we're going to actually practice some things today. But first, first of all, I just want to start by giving everyone here permission to not be your best self sometimes. Permission to feel out of sorts, permission to not feel normal. It 
isn't a normal time. This world we're in right now is not, it's not normal. And the best thing that you can do for yourself right now is to just practice self-love and compassion when you're experiencing, you know, maybe you're not showing up as your best self. And one of the really interesting things that we're good at as humans is, you know, maybe we're kind of feeling irritable and we um, show up as not our best self with a partner or your kids or maybe your dog, maybe on the call with your mom. And then we're really good at beating ourselves up afterward, right? It's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I'm so unkind. And you kind of go into this loop, uh, which can be really hard on you. So especially in a time like this where there just isn't the sense of normal uh, to really get good at give yourself a break, you know, just accept and a little bit of, of compassion for your own situation and uh, not beating yourself up so much. So permission to feel like you're losing your mind, to feel out of control, to not show up as your best self sometimes, that's okay. So we're gonna be talking a lot about this, this continuum. Um, and as you're thinking about the, uh, as we're going through the topics, kind of be thinking about where you typically fall and maybe some patterns of what might make you slide from one end to the other. Like I mentioned, things are a little bit different than we're used to. Regardless, uh, most of the time we go about on autopilot where we're not really being intentional or conscious of how we're taking in information, you know, just firing through emails, uh, finishing conversations, just scrolling mindlessly through social media without really paying attention to how it's affecting us or uh, what we're receiving there. So autopilot. So the, real, the very first step in mental health is to get in a practice of raising it to top of mind. And what I mean by this is we talk about mental health all the time. It's a conversation that goes on all of the time uh, now, which is great. Uh, it's really important. But there's still this knowing doing gap of uh, mental health is a thing. I need to be thinking about it to wait, how am I right now? Recognizing that you move all, throughout a day, you're going to move across that continuum in various states, depending on how you're reacting to the world around you, how much rest you've had, how much nourishment your body has, what kind of sights and sound you've let into your world, and how you respond to those. So throughout any portion of a day, your mental health can be anywhere inside of that, that spectrum, right? And so it's getting better at bridging that knowing, doing gap to not just I should be thinking about mental health, but it's time now to trigger something to check in on my mental health. So one of the ways to do that is a body scan. And I don't know, are you guys familiar with what body scan? Is this familiar terminology? Yeah, somewhat. So it's a really effective way to check in on your current physical state because your nervous system is wired to respond to the world around you, right? And so it's always interpreting what's happening, the events that are unfolding, what information you're taking in, how you're processing it, and how you interpret it is based off of programming you've got before you're eight years old. Your, your belief systems, your, um, that this set of ideas and values and how you perceive the world is largely programmed before you're eight. So way before you're consciously making choices about what certain situations mean or don't mean. And so based off of that programming and everyone is different, you're gonna interpret events in different ways. And your, your subconscious is constantly doing this, trying to free up time for your conscious to do other things. And so from what it gathers, it's feeding signals to your nervous system that sets off a nervous system response. So your nervous system is responding to your environment, even if your brain, your conscious brain, isn't paying attention to it directly. So what can be really useful is to teach your conscious brain to check in and talk to your nervous system to see how it's, how it's behaving. Is it activated? Is it charged? What's happening in your nervous system? And it's a really simple process and really effective uh, because your body is responding and you're just on autopilot doing the things. And so you might notice yourself getting more and more agitated, but by triggering this body scan, you can actually check in before it becomes a problem and starts to show up and, you know, not showing up as your best self. So first though, is to get build in this habit of triggering body scans, the process of checking out of the world around you and checking into your internal world. And over time, this is something I do all day, uh, just, checking in after a phone conversation, checking in before a conversation, just to see, am I charged up? What's my nervous system doing? Am I gonna show up as my best self? Just like if you were taking, um, if you were looking after blood pressure, you know, you would be actually taking your blood pressure throughout the day, just checking to see where it's at. This is very similar. 
Uh, so we're actually going to do this practice uh, just to, because by practicing, you can kind of get a sense of what it's about and then it becomes a little tool in your tool belt that you can pull out um, as those things, as you kind of notice it's time to check in. So I'm gonna get you to close your eyes because that helps you to shift focus, check out of the world around you and to check internally. And I'm gonna get you to shift your focus to your face. So kind of paying attention to your face and the muscles, your jawline, are you scowling? Or is your face soft and relaxed? Are you smiling? So what's your face doing? What's your jawline doing? And just notice it. Don't try to apply a label of good or bad. Just notice what's happening. Interesting. Just noticing. Then you're gonna shift your focus down to your shoulders and your neck. And you're gonna notice where your shoulders are. Are they tied up around your, your ears and tense? Is your neck stiff or is it relaxed? And your shoulders drop back. Again, just noticing. Then we're gonna go over to your breath. And we're gonna notice where you're pulling breath from. Is it from the top of your chest or from deep in your belly? Just sit there for a moment as you're breathing and notice where you're getting your air from. And we're gonna move through exploring more to the full body and how are you sitting? How are you, are you contracted and small and tight and tense? Are your muscles all tight? And you're just gonna explore and shift your focus through to your hands and to your arms and to your lower back. Just exploring to see what state your body is in. Is it, does it think it needs to be ready for a fight or flight scenario? Just exploring. All right, and I'll get you to come back to the room. So as you're exploring, you can you might have noticed that you you relax a little as you shift focus, which is also helpful. But you can kind of check in to be like, oh, I've been sitting really tense. Like this is my nervous system is reacting. Uh, okay, that's interesting. And you're just paying attention to what your body is telling you. So we go through and you just, just by shifting focus to, to recognize like, are you scowling and concentrated? Is it really intense? What's behind that scowl? You know, is it, are you feeling really tight and contracted? So through the face, the shoulders and neck, your breath, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the breath in a moment, and then through your body. And then just be thinking about, okay, from that body scan, where would you kind of peg yourself? Where are you at right now? And maybe where you're at at the beginning of it versus the end of it, if you noticed a shift just by the process of checking in. All right, so that's the physical aspect. That's checking in, that's getting your conscious brain to connect to your nervous system so that you can see what's happening. Then the next part is story time. So you've checked in on your physical body and maybe you've recognized some signs of contraction or maybe expansiveness and things are good. This is also great to get into story time if you're in an, an experience of expansiveness. So all day long, you have this narrator running on in your mind, right? Does that that resonate with anyone, this little voice that is always, always talking. Some people have really, really loud narrators, other people, not so much. It's very personal. So whether you resonate when I'm talking about those voices in your head or not, the narrator exists. It's part of the human experience where and how we experience the world. We're the only species on the planet that thinks about something and then thinks about thinking about the thing or worries about something and then worries about how much we're worrying about something. So the next part of this mental health check-in is to check in on the stories that are floating through your mind. So depending how close you are to those inner thoughts, uh, it really depends like how much you've been listening to that narrator and slowing things down and really checking in. It may require some practice, you know, kind of like if you're working out and you, you can't quite get that form right, uh, you have to practice until you get the most out of your workout. Learning to slow things down upstairs and pay attention to it is a skill that you can learn and improve. Um, how many people here have tried meditation? Just by show of hands, yeah? Tried it? You notice how like when you're in the process of trying to calm the mind and empty the mind that it gets busy and suddenly you're thinking all of the things? It's that narrator we're talking about. So your inner voice just like, um, so the inner voice and those, those thoughts that are coming through, again, they're not, you're not asking for them. They're just coming out of nowhere, right? It's not something you're consciously deciding to think about the groceries or to be worrying about something. You are not those thoughts. They're just happening. So this next exercise we're going to do is going to 
teach to get you to practice creating distance between the dialogue and then what you're accepting to explore, what you're choosing consciously to explore, rather than letting that narrator kind of take you down these rabbit holes. So I'm going to teach you this little visualization exercise that I've been doing for years uh, to the point where I can drop into my place really quickly and kind of sort things out. Uh, again, that's, that's that practice part. Uh, with the idea that we'll get you to help to notice the stories that are happening in the throes of your mind and without getting too attached to them and having that emotional charge that can be connected to them when you are experiencing your thought instead of visualizing them. So I'm going to get you to close your eyes for a moment. And we're just going to work to take a couple of deep breaths and slow things down. So we're going to breathe in. And breathe out. We're going to breathe in as you're breathing out you're just noticing you're relaxing one more time breathe in and out relaxing back the shoulders now i want you to imagine that you're in a wide open park and there's no one else there just you your beautiful park just you and these big trees with branches for climbing and thick green grass that's far as you can see running up over the hills way off on the horizon. It's a wide open park. And imagine this park bench just ahead of you, sitting right there next to a giant oak tree. And you can feel the warmth of the sun shining down on your face and you can hear sound of a chickadee behind you as you wander over to this park bench. And you sit down on it and the seat's warm, sun shining, no one around you, you look up and there's this wide open blue sky. And as you're staring at the sky, you notice a few of those clouds floating by, those big white fluffy ones. You start to see a few shapes. It's those big white fluffy clouds, maybe a rabbit, maybe a turtle. And as you're sitting on this bench, you notice that those fluffy clouds start to turn into thought bubbles, each cloud holding a thought. Maybe a story about the groceries you need to buy. We're just gonna slow things down. You have nowhere to be but on this bench watching the clouds thought bot float on by. We're gonna watch what thoughts fill those, those bubbles, what thoughts those clouds hold. Maybe there's a fear about how the kids are doing, how your mom is doing. There it is, just watching it float by. Interesting. You can decide later which clouds you'll pay attention to and what you just want to let float away. But for now, just notice those stories. Interesting. Staying curious, almost with amusement. It just These thoughts are coming out of nowhere. They just pop up and fill a cloud in the sky. And you get to decide if you'll give them attention as you sit on this bench. Just noticing the thoughts. And we'll just take a moment of quiet as you just notice those thoughts floating by. And if you notice you start to feel charged with any of the thoughts, just remember you're sitting on your park bench and it's drifting away and let it float on by. You can get it later. You are not your thoughts. Interesting. Maybe there's some funny ones. All right, I'll get you to come back to the room. So this little exercise can be really helpful to help you sort through what stories, thoughts, feelings, beliefs are behind what your body is experiencing. And it's really useful to slow things down when you're feeling this, this sense of turmoil or chaos. So you can just sort through and be like, oh, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm worrying about. Oh, that's what's got me so irritable. And then you can do some exercises where you actually decide which thoughts you're going to explore. So maybe some of those thoughts are really weighing on you, really creating anxiety, and you need to bring them down and hold on to them and examine them and explore them, not from that you are that, you are not that thought, or that it's not a real thought or not a true thought, but there it is. Where did it come from? What is the truth in it? Is it all true? Almost every thought you have has two sides to it right? So if you start to explore them, and this is one of the fun, anyone here familiar with like cognitive behavior therapy or irrational thinking um, therapy, anything like that? So 
basically, my mom used to tell me I should be a lawyer because I was really good at arguing. And when I learned about CBT and the ability to take a thought that, that just came out of nowhere and it's really creating a charge and an emotional response, but to take it and explore it and then to look for some bias that might be creating it, to look for ways to disprove it as true or the whole truth or enough truth to really get you as activated as you are. And so if you found any of those thoughts that really carry an emotional charge and are causing that anxiety or, or, or any sort of sadness or fear, then you can start to write it out on paper. It was, you saw it float by, it was there. Well, you can pull it in and write it on paper. And so the exercise, um, and you can even, if you have paper there and you wanted to just write, write it down to go through it later, you just put the thought that's creating the emotional charge on the left side of, on the left side of a page. And on the right, you start to write down all of the other stories that are associated or things that aren't entirely true. Uh, so for example, my kids aren't gonna be okay. I'm, I'm afraid my kids aren't going to be, aren't going to get their education. Okay. Is that, is that true? Well, I am, I do feel worried that they won't get their education, but there's ways that they can get their education. So here's the plan. And you can kind of sort through and argue against that thought and, and find the other side of it. Does that make sense? Just to, you're trying to argue your own thoughts and eventually you can start to diminish the emotional charge that they have because they're not quite as big as they were when they were just swirling around unconsciously and creating this activation in your system. Because what you think about gets bigger, right? What you think about gets bigger. So if there's something that's creating a bunch of emotional charge, you can bring it in and get it to be smaller by consciously working through that thought. And then you have kind of a response to it the next time it shows up. So we checked in with their body, you checked in with their stories to get a better sense of what's happening in your inner world. So again, you can kind of be thinking about on, on your spectrum, on your continuum, where are you at? All right, so this is just about raising awareness, that first step, right? About figuring out, okay, where am I at right now? Being conscious about what's my emotional, what's my mental health state? And what's really important about this exercise is to not to judge yourself. We're really good at wanting to apply a label of whether something is good or bad or right or wrong, but it's really important not to judge yourself wherever you're at because it, that continuum shifts, right? And so wherever you're at in any given moment is just where you are. And it's important, don't ignore where you're at. It's easy to want to ignore, you know, maybe a, being in a vulnerable state or a stress state. In fact, Western culture is notorious for distraction, repression, disassociation, just disassociating from our emotions. But the truth is humans are an emotional species. Like it's inner wiring, it's part of our biology. And if the word emotion gets you a little bit squirmy, I used to get really um, squirmy around emotions, but we have to get used to it. it we have this emotional part of our brain um, that separates us from the reptiles, right? You, dogs have it as well. You know when a dog is happy or when a dog is afraid or sad or angry. You don't really know when a reptile is sad or angry. This is part of our, our makeup. So the emotional brain is one of the three brains that we have. You can do research. I won't drop too much into that. It's called the triune brain. What I'm trying to say is that it doesn't do anyone, especially you, any good to pretend that you're fine when your system is activated and your mental health is deteriorating. So wherever you're at is where you're at, and that's perfectly okay. And during this particular world right now, you have permission to not be okay sometimes. You have permission to be angry, to be afraid, to be sad, to be happy. Whatever's happening for you is what is. It really becomes about what's next. So we did the awareness and the acceptance, and now it gets into the choices. What's next? Where do you want to be? Because what you do next is really the critical part. Now that you know where you are and you're not avoiding it, it's time to choose what you want to do about it. You don't have to do anything, right? You can just continue about your day. Yep, I'm angry or I'm afraid, but I've got work to do and away you go. That's one option. And sometimes that's the, right, that's the option you need to go with. That's what has to happen. But it's about being conscious about the choice and recognizing that eventually you'll need to do something. So how many people here are familiar with the amygdala? Have you guys heard the amygdala? Yeah, it's out there more and more. It's kind of fun when the science that you learn about in psychology and in university is now like mainstream. 
So it's this part of the brain that helps your body survive. It's what's, it's what's responsible for your fight or flight response, uh, the thing that gets your nervous system going. It's essentially the part of the brain that helps you survive and why humans have lasted so long that reason for fight or flight, right? So, but the funny thing that happens with the brain is if your amygdala is firing, and your cortisol levels are rising, so which is what happens when your body goes into a stress state, your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that does the thinking, the executive functioning, decision making, it's not that effective. So essentially, if you're in an activated state, your brain just can't function that well. And so the reason I'm talking about this is you can just dig in and get to work and just, you know, go through it. But there's the truth of it is that your brain isn't actually being that effective and there's not anything you can do about it. You might feel foggy or disjointed, not know what to do with yourself, or maybe just jumping from task to task and you can't focus. Um, maybe just getting really distracted because your mind is actually trying to solve for what has got it so on edge and it's looking for the problems. So what I'm saying is if you're not taking time to care for your mental health, the ripple effect is quite damaging. So if you're not practicing self-care for your mental health, you're at risk to further deteriorating it, which can lead to, you know, missed work, uh, damaged relationships, uh, and you're not showing up as your best self and the impacts that happen. So noticing where you're at on this spectrum and intentionally working on your mental health to bring it back in shape is the most important thing for you, your relationships, your employer. So let's just quickly go through some of the signs of deteriorating, deteriorating mental health. So you might find yourself irritable. Uh, that's a big one. Uh, trouble sleeping, trouble concentrating or learning. Someone's talking to you and you can barely even hear them. Maybe just feeling tired and low energy. Uh, changes in appetite. You don't really want to eat or you want to eat everything. Increased use of distraction methods. So more snacking, substance use. Uh, sudden, you know, just less emotionally available. Maybe you're checking out. Uh, you can see how your mental health affects your ability to just show up as your best self and contribute to the relationships you're a part of and the work you're meant to do. So suddenly taking a few minutes a day to just check in and practice some simple self-care practices, pushing that work aside for just a moment, knowing that when you come back into it, you'll be able to do, contribute so much more. So let's just go through a couple um, of, of self-care really easy self-care tips and tricks, and they're not going to be that mind-blowing. Again, this is this knowing-doing gap of, I know the things, but I don't necessarily know I should do the things, or I don't connect that I should do the things. And so this is where starting with that, that habit of checking in, taking your mental health check, you know, like you take your blood pressure, and then recognizing, ah, okay, I'm gonna do something. So this first one, you know how we were talking about breathing from your chest or your belly? So your breathing actually sends signals to your nervous system and your nervous system will uh, send signals to your body to breathe shallow. So if you're breathing shallow, you're actually keeping your body in a cycle of stress, in a stress state, because your body thinks that if you're breathing shallow, there's something bad happening. Just like if you're stressed, your breathing will go shallow. And so you can actually change some of the cortisol levels by consciously moving your breath from your chest to your belly and it'll slow down your nervous system response. So those two are connected. And so this is why breathing works so effectively. And it's a tool we have, we're doing it all of the time, but the difference is we're not doing it consciously. And so we're typically breathing from our chest, which is actually creating these cortisol level spikes. So something you can just be mindful of is the breath work. And we're gonna do this quick box breath, which is really simple. And it just takes like 16 counts. So we're going to inhale for four, and we're going to hold for four, and we're going to exhale for four, and hold for four. We'll do that again. Inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, and hold for four. Very simple exercise, probably not that unfamiliar, but there's science behind it that says your, your breathing has slowed down and gone to your belly, so your stress state will come down as well. Your nervous system will relax. So this is just one very easy tool you have that you can do anytime. 
just so just by sinking your breath you know you're going for four so it's inhale for four hold for four exhale hold 16 counts can just uh, slow down your system to reduce the cortisol levels and free some mental capacity for engaging with the world all right next is mental breaks and this is different for everyone so this is where i just want you to be thinking about what's your optimal mental break because if your mind is going non-stop you can just exhaust your capacities deplete your resources and really impact your ability to participate in conversations and work right and science really supports the idea that there's these diminishing returns on forcing your brain to solve problems when it's depleted so yeah you could stay at your desk or stay in the in the moment trying to figure it out feeling just the intensity and the stress is the solution you know it's like can't figure it out or you can unplug the mind and take it offline and just give it a little break. You know, you don't keep doing push-ups when your body is tired because you'll fall on your face. And yet we'll sit in a problem and fight and fight to try to come up with the solution when your brain is too stressed to be able to come up with the solution. So you really do have to practice reps and sets with your brain as well. So recognizing when it's time for mental break is a powerful tool to support your mental health so let's just go through a couple of the things that are most of us know and think about what works the best for you because although i know i feel better when i listen to music it took a long time for me to listen to music to feel better that, that difference of like this is something i feel good when i'm doing i need to put it in my toolkit as the thing i do when i want to feel better so exercise you've got to do it intense enough that you can't maintain a conversation doesn't have to be a long time. You can find some four minute YouTube videos that'll kick your ass and boost your mental health just to unplug your mind. Uh, music is a great one uh, for a lot of people, just plugging in music, the power of sound and how it connects to the mind. If you've ever um, seen your brain on music, there's some really cool stuff that happens. So plugging in some music, moving your body, practicing breath work, it's really a magic trifecta. Uh, your physiology shifts dramatically and it doesn't take more than a song or two to do it. Nature, the science behind nature is really profound. Um, they call it forest bathing and what it does to creativity and um, cortisol levels. So there's a study in Asia that showed a 12% difference in the decrease in cortisol from going in like a leisurely walk in the forest to a leisurely walk in like an urban walk through the city. 12% difference in, in the cortisol uh, levels. So getting out to touch nature, that can just be like take your socks off and go stand in the grass or get really close with a big plant. Smell, smell some flowers, literally. It, the science backs it up. So create, this is uh, for people who enjoy creating and don't get frustrated from, you find something you love to do, right? So um, it really takes your left brain offline and brings your right brain over. So if you enjoy painting or drawing, maybe making music, just something that allows you to create and um, an output, an outlet. A magical thing happens when you take your focus from your in internal world and shift it out. So doing something nice for someone else is a really great way to boost your oxytocin and lower your cortisol levels and, and create con um, connections. So those pro-social behaviors are really good for your mental health. Um, I mean, not only does it make you feel better, but you're making someone else feel better too. So that's a really great mental break. Uh, pet a dog. I mean, if you're a cat person, you could pet a cat as well. They're a little bit more uh, sassy. But have you ever noticed how much dogs are just so loyal? And even though it's so annoying sometimes how much they love you, if you appreciate for a moment how much they love you, that really does do wonders for your stress levels. So one thing I do want to we'll be wrapping up here. Um, one thing I do want to leave you with is just there's a ton of resources. And so um, mental health really like it matters if you're not looking after it when it goes nothing else matters um, it's it, it's very serious so it's something you want to be paying attention to there's a ton of resources out there so Canadian Mental Health Association has a whole bunch the Canadian Psychological Association eMentalHealth.ca the Mental Health Commission of Canada Healthy Minds Canada of course we've got an employee assistance program where you can call and just get help at any time if you just need someone to get you unstuck so because sometimes your mental health is just stuck and it's affecting your ability to face the challenges of the day to day. And it's just so important to acknowledge that and get support and get support early. You know, like if you're having trouble, um, you know, gaining strength or losing weight and you've plateaued in your, in your plan, you're going to bring in an expert to kind of get you out of that rut, to get you unstuck. Someone who can help you with form and nutrition because bringing in an x-ray, an expert can just accelerate you coming back to feeling within your normal range again. So don't shirk your mental health. And like, if you need to talk to someone, 
do so early. It's uh, especially when we have these great programs uh, with IQ metrics uh, that we can use. There's also mobile crisis services, uh, crisis stabilization units, the mental health crisis response center, um, a ton of resources. And then there's lots of free apps. There's MindShift, Breathe, Always There, Calm, Happify, Budify, um, Headspace, uh, Waking Up. There's just all of the, Waking Up is not free, but it's really good. It's with Sam Harris. Uh, so there's all these apps that, again, it's about bridging that knowing doing gap to say, I have an app and I actually use it as well. Um, so just leveraging some of these resources to kind of spend a few minutes a day, just kind of bringing your mental health up your right if it's on a spectrum and you're spending a few minutes a day to just like manage it you're just slowly shifting it up or keeping it keeping it in a normal range so just as a summary um what's most important is to be mindful and paying attention right like checking in that blood pressure thing like this is something we should be checking in all the time as we're going we're adjusting to this very strange time um being really intentional about it making decisions about where you want to be and what you're willing to do to get there and connecting the I feel this way I need to do this thing and then I can feel the way I want to or I'm more likely to move toward where I want the way I want to feel um, and then give yourself a break sometimes it's just you need a day off and to cry on the couch like flushing and crying is part of the body's response system to clear and emotionally process our body has to do it uh, that's why we will cry when we don't want to like it's not like we cry on purpose it's our body naturally trying to process emotion and there's healthy crying and unhealthy crying and if you know if you find that crying isn't making you feel better again reach out and, and get help but all of these things our body bodies are pretty amazing at recognizing what you need and it's usually trying to tell you if we get better at connecting in and checking in and then taking some of these really simple steps that are just with our bodies uh, to be able to manage our mental health. So that's my time for today. Cool. Well, permission to lose your mind and how to find it again. It's what it's all about. It's just like give yourself a break. Whatever you're experiencing is, is okay in that moment. And then decide what you're going to do next uh, so that you can continue to look after yourselves.